Welcome, friends, to the worship of God with the people of Augusta Road Baptist Church, a loving, inclusive Christian community that lives out its faith through transformative relationships, engaging worship, radical hospitality, and faithful service. Thank you for joining us for this online worship experience on the 16th Sunday after Pentecost. On this day and every day, we pray that you feel the grace and peace of Christ with you right where you are. We also want you to know that whoever you are and wherever you are, you are welcome among us. We consider you to be part of our faith community, and we invite you to connect with us in any ways that you can. Let us know if God uses something in this experience to speak directly to you, and help us to know if there are ways that we as a community of faith can help you connect with God right where you are. In other words, let us know how we can be church for you. We also invite everyone to partner with us in ministry as together we seek to live out God's calling for us in the world. It takes all of our efforts if we're going to successfully live into both the mission and the vision that Christ has given us. And you can join us. You can join us by giving financially. You can give through our online portal on our church website, arbc.com, or through our church app. And if you are in our area on Sunday mornings and want to join us in person as well, you can give in worship in the sanctuary or if we're gathering in our parking lot each week at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. You can also, of course, send gifts and tithes and offerings through the mail to the church office. We're always grateful for your support. We're grateful to be able to partner with you as together we bear witness to what we see Christ doing in us and through us and in the world around us. So again, no matter who you are or where you are, if you are worshiping with us, you're part of our faith community. We love you and we welcome you in the name of Christ. So welcome to worship and the peace of Christ be with you. The Psalm of the day comes from Psalm 116 verses one through nine. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Lord, we come to this moment to hear your words of healing, love, and hope. So enter our hearts and our spirits and teach us to follow you. Give us courage and strength to be your faithful disciples. We know how easy it is for us to say that we follow you and then turn our backs and act as though our commitment to you does not mean anything to us. But Jesus challenges us to take up our crosses. When we don't understand what that means, the extent to which we're called to go, we have a tendency to just shrug and turn away. So forgive us for our lack of commitment and faith, O God. Heal us of our hesitancy. Give us courage to be disciples and enable us to joyfully proclaim your healing mercies and your transformational love. O oh God, you've commissioned us to be teachers and witnesses to your great majesty. So may your Holy Spirit give guidance to the words that we speak and the works we do in your name, that in all things we might honor you and bring others into your family. We recognize, O oh God, that our hearts are filled with situations concerning family and friends, concerning our neighborhoods, and concerning the world. We seek your healing mercies for each of these situations. Help us to also remember that the same healing mercy is offered to each one of us. Give us strength and courage to truly follow Jesus in ways that offer healing and hope to those around us and that lift others up. For we live and we worship and we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. i 
reading from the letter of James, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Listen for a good word from the Lord. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness, for all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes is in speaking is perfect, able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look at ships, though they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great a forest is set ablaze by a small fire, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a world of iniquity. It stains the whole body sets on fire the cycle of nature, and is itself set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by the human species. But no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Words can lift up and words can bring us down. We all know this to be true. There have been times when we have been down and someone said something to us. They offered a compliment or a word of encouragement, and the entire trajectory of our day changed in that one moment. The opposite has been true in our experience as well. We have likely all experienced one of those moments when we have done something very well, and we are reaping the praise of our actions. Everyone is loving on us, except for that one person. There's one critique, one bad review, one negative comment that wasn't the least bit constructive, and I can almost guarantee that is the one that we will remember. That is the one we will dwell on. It is as if all of the positive stuff has suddenly been canceled out by one moment of negativity. But given enough of these moments, we eventually start to believe them. So I've been helping out in our after-school ministry, driving one of the buses this past week. It's a privilege to be able to do so. 
I've been able to be with a little over half of our kids in our after school ministry every day this week simply by being there to pick them up in, at school in the afternoon. They were honestly a little surprised, maybe a little weirded out when they saw Pastor Matt, as they call me, picking them up. I've seen some of the members of our church and our friends from the neighborhood, and they'll do a double take when they see who is behind the wheel of ARBC bus number one. It's been fun. I get to greet the kids. I get to ask how their day's been going. They're incredibly polite, saying thank you for the ride when they get off the bus and when they arrive on campus. And I just get to sit there and, well, listen. The other day I had picked up at one of our elementary schools. And one of the young girls that got on the bus that day was in a foul mood. It had apparently been a pretty rough day for her. She was talking about all the challenges she was having with her classmates, and she summed it all up with one phrase, nobody likes me. It's heartbreaking to hear that from an elementary school student, but we've all been there, haven't we? We've all been in that place where it felt like all of our relationships were going wrong. Nothing was going right. We couldn't do anything right with our actions. It seemed like everyone was saying mean things about us, picking on us and bullying us, it was a nobody likes me, everybody hates me, guess I'll go eat worms kind of a day for her. We've all had days like that. Nobody likes me, she said. And she said it enough times that she sounded pretty convinced that it was true. That was until the girl sitting next to her offered the positive counterpunch. Well, she said, I like you. She only had to say it once, but it was amazing how that one statement seemed to offer the reassurance the first young girl needed. She needed to know, just in the words, that there was one person out there that saw her, appreciated her for who she was, and liked her. She needed to hear that counteract everything else that she had heard and felt that day. Words are powerful. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt me. But we know that isn't true, don't we? It's something that we try to tell ourselves to thicken our skin and help us endure whatever comes our way. Sticks and stones may break our bones, but words hurt too. So the writer of the letter of James tells us that we need to watch what we say to other people. Our words have the power to shape things. The tongue is a powerful instrument. It can be used for good. It can also be used for evil. In James' language, we have tamed so much of God's creation, all the animals out there, but we cannot seem to tame the beast within our own bodies that has such directional, even destructive power that it is as if it could spark fires like a match in a dried forest, set direction like turning a horse like a bridle, and steer the course of someone's life like a ship's rudder. It's like James heard someone spouting words full of vitriol and then asked, would you praise your God with that mouth? He says we need to watch what we say, because on the one hand, we come to worship and we're praising God, proclaiming God's truth, trying to teach God's way to others. But on the other hand, we use our words to curse and put someone down as well. It makes us hypocrites. We only end up doing incredible harm to the message that we are trying to preach with the rest of our lives. If I can confess for a moment. One of the most important moments on my spiritual journey came when I was in high school. I was out to dinner with some friends on a Friday night, just hanging out. A group of people walked in the restaurant where we were, and I saw them and I repeated something that I had heard from one of my other friends that wasn't sitting at the table with us at the time. The other friend thought it was a joke. It turns out it wasn't a joke at all. It was incredibly offensive. It should have never been uttered, especially by me. I honestly don't know what I was thinking. Maybe I just thought I'd try it out with another friend and see what happened in that sort of teenage test of boundaries. It only took a split second. I just leaned over to the friend next to me and I whispered it in his ear. No one else could hear. I knew it was probably inappropriate, but I guess I thought it should have been benign because it had nothing to do with the friend that I was sitting with. He didn't laugh. In fact, he didn't say anything at least not to me. A few days later, another of my friends came up to me and said, I heard you said this the other day. And she was furious. She was incredibly disappointed, as she should have been. 
I should have known better. I did know better. Yeah, it was just words, one statement. They weren't even my words, but I had said them. And they couldn't be excused. I was terrified when I realized what I had done. So I lied. I denied. Many of my friends started to look at me differently and it ate at me. My mother could tell that something was wrong with me and I lied to her too. I told her that people were saying I said this thing when I didn't. She got my dad involved. They made me go over to this friend's house and my dad defended me. If my son says he didn't say it, he didn't say it. My friend's father defended him. If my son says that your son said it, then he said it. And only after we left did I finally come clean to my dad. The look of disappointment on his face will haunt me forever. I had made an unimaginable mistake in his eyes. I went against everything that he had ever taught me. On top of everything, I had lied about it to everyone. I had dragged my parents into it to the point of him defending me. And I don't know that he had ever been so disappointed. What may have been the worst aspect of this entire encounter was that the friend I had whispered this horrible thing to was not a Christian. And it was reported to me by other friends that were as disappointed in me as anyone that he was almost heartbroken. I thought Matt was a Christian, he said to them. How could he have said something like this? As ashamed as everyone else was, I assure you that I was most ashamed of myself. I've carried that moment with me as a lesson ever since. I know the power of the tongue and the words it speaks. It changes things in only a moment. Now, thank God that I was able to reconcile with and regain the trust of those that I had hurt, but it could have easily gone a different direction. I learned the power of words that day. Even things said in the most casual conversation have the power to build up and lift up and the power to destroy. Our tongue must be tamed for our sake and for the sake of the message that we convey as a people of faith. So consider a short and simple list of ways the words we speak cause great harm to others and could easily get us into trouble. We speak slander and lies about other people. That one's in the Ten Commandments. Do not bear false witness. Do not say something that you know to be untrue, especially when it's about someone else. It ruins reputations. It causes unnecessary trouble. It drags someone else down, but it doesn't actually lift you up because it's sin. We gossip. We hear something about someone else and it feels juicy. And for some reason, someone else's pain or scandal makes us feel better about what we have going on. And spreading it gives us a cheap thrill. We've all know people who have even found ways to spread gossip wrapped in the guise of spirituality. They call it a prayer request. Really, they just want to speak ill of someone else in front of everyone else. They wanted to feel powerful by being in the know, but it didn't need to be said. And going to the person or holding what that person told you in confidence could be a far greater service for them. We complain and we grumble. And as followers of Christ, we are called to be people of joy and hope. We are called to recognize God's abundance around us and the potential for good and redemption in all things. Still, our complaints can suck the joy right out of all the good that is going on around us. We need to be constructive in our comments. We need to be solutions-oriented people instead of simply airing our grievances about what we don't like or what we wish was different. Don't be those people who complain about everything. Believe me, no one wants to be around them. And we speak in rash ways. This goes back to being slow to anger and slow to speak. Instead of listening actively and patiently, we allow our emotions to take over. We speak before we think, before we think about the impact of our words. We lose control of what we are meaning to say. So slow down, listen more. And this is especially true in heated conversations and debate. Rise above and refuse to simply insult someone. Stay calm and level-headed. Hear the other person out. Respond in love, not in hate. And take a deep breath and count to ten. Gather your thoughts and gather yourself. Whatever you need to do to endure so that your words can be said in an appropriate fashion. So often the words we speak get us into trouble because we are simply reacting instead of processing and remaining steady and calm. 
So again, think back to the first chapter in the letter of James where he wrote that people needed to be slow to speak and quick to listen, be slow to get angry because our angry anger doesn't lead to God's righteousness. So slow down, he said. Don't simply react. Listen to learn instead of respond. Remain calm and steady instead of letting your anger get the better of you. That's when you say something that you don't really mean. That's when you risk this saying something that you can't take back. Because once it's been said, it can't be unsaid. And once it's been heard, it can't be unheard. And the list could go on and on. And you could likely diagnose the areas in your own life where you need to work, the places where your words that you speak get you into trouble. But it isn't just the words we speak today, is it? The same power and danger that we recognize in James in the tongue could just as easily be applied to the fingers as well. These days, it isn't just what we say to others, it's what we type as well. It's what we post online and how we comment on what other people post and share and type as well. Just last week, after Clemson lost to Georgia in the opening game of the football season, for those of you who know that I'm a Georgia grad, I promise this is the last time that I'll mention it. The Greenville News, our local paper, ran an article discussing the hate that Clemson's offensive coordinator and quarterback received once what Coach Dabo Sweeney called the thumb gangsters got to work. They commented and sent direct messages filled with hate and threats. There were suggestions that they should be cut or fired and go on to other things. They were personal attacks and didn't have anything constructive in Now, I can get as passionate about my football team as anyone, and I can be as disappointed in a loss as anyone. What these two men experienced could have happened to anyone on any team that loses, but it was one loss and against a top five team. No, it wasn't the performance that we've come to expect from a team like that that's been so successful, but ultimately we're talking about a game. A game that the vast majority of those who commented likely have never played. They have no idea what it takes to put in the work to make it to that level and then to face that kind of pressure and to experience that kind of disappointment on that kind of stage. They just wanted to pile on and bully and make matters worse. It was directed at the team they cheer for too and it did nothing to bring any more light into the world. The internet and social media seem to have revealed a deep toxicity within humanity. We feel free to say things, to insult people and cut them down, to bully, troll, and torment when sitting safely behind a screen in ways that we would never if someone was standing right in front of our faces. And some people have leaned into this outright meanness and said, well, I'm free to say whatever I want. Isn't that great? But just because you're free to say something doesn't mean that you should. It's simply the worst of what is inside us coming out unprocessed and unchecked by our faith. And it eats away at people. They start to believe whatever is being said is true. And people have taken their own lives because of internet trolling and it's heartbreaking. And you see people who claim to be followers of Christ joining in all the time. They're mean, judgmental, hate-filled, and we wonder why people are rejecting the faith. It isn't because of Jesus. It's because they don't see or hear Jesus in the words that those who claim to be his followers say and type. The words we say and type have incredible power. They can build others up and by extension build up the kingdom of God or they can possibly do irreparable harm. So how might we as people of faith change the conversation? How might we use our words for good to make the world a little bit brighter? Taylor Bertolini is a student at Nova Southeastern University. When she was in middle school and high school, she understood the power of harmful words that she heard, and she started to believe that she was worthless because of them. She sat in the back of her class, hoping not to be seen. She wondered if anyone would miss her if she wasn't there. But she also remembers the power of being seen and lifted up by just one person in class who was excited to see her. She also remembers the power of her mom, noticing how down she seemed and deciding that she would start leaving her notes of encouragement everywhere. So she found them in her lunchbox at school, in the pantry and refrigerator at home. 
She found them on the bathroom mirror, even inside the washing machine when she lifted it up to put in the laundry her mother had given her. And each word of affirmation, each note of love acted like a rudder on a ship of her life, steering against the waves of negativity to keep her going in the right direction. She's not shy about the positive impact, perhaps life-saving impact, as these little notes had on her life. She wanted to bring that to others as well. So she organized a moment to, to partner with a movement called Campus Cursive that operates on campuses across the country. There are spots to leave notes of encouragement so that someone can come across this board and read and take a note that they need specifically on that day. Or people can nominate one of their friends to Campus Cursive volunteers because they're going through a truly rough time and they need a word of encouragement and hope. And before they know it, there will be a knock on their dorm room door They'll open it and they'll find a stack of handwritten letters, each one using words of affirmation and encouragement and love to powerful effect. Again, the words we say and type and write have incredible power. They can build others up and by extension the kingdom of God, or they can possibly do irreparable harm. Imagine if we found ways to tame our tongue and even our fingers just how much impact we could have on the world around us. Amen.